it's been a very demanding semester, but I wanted to let everybody know we're surviving. We're meeting in person and I actually have um, some photographs to show you. So this is our um, socially distant experience. And I have to say the spirit of the students has been terrific, um, as you can see. So they're surviving quite well. And um, we're excited that uh, we could continue. And um, so COVID hasn't stopped us. The current class is working on editing their documentaries. And we will have a film festival sometime. We're not sure when. Uh, we're, we're waiting for the vaccine. Maybe Yamish, you can tell us when the vaccine will happen so we can have our festival. Um, we would, um, we have, um, we're part of Doc NYC. So if you'd like to see the uh, three films from last semester, check it out. All of this is on our Facebook page. We have another Inside Lens happening. And I wanted to share some awards that we've received. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Laura Zephyrin, who just won our Sixth Student Academy Award. Laura, do you want to talk a little bit about that and your BAFTA Award? Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Marcia. So we didn't see each other since February. We didn't know the last time will be the last time. So it was in February. Um, so I'm very grateful. Thank you so much for everything you've done. And I'm very grateful for all the people, the students, the teachers I've met because it's allowed me to a certain extent to be on the right path. And it has been a very tough journey, but what I will remember, it's not really like as a destination, the fact of winning a world, it's amazing. It's uh, a huge recognition, but I would say that uh, I learned so much about myself and I met so many people. And I think what I'm the most proud of is that I hope it has impacted some people, like around me, some people stop eating fish. So if you don't know, my documentary is about this uh, female ocean activist. And so I would say that uh, this is what I will remember. It has, your story can impact people and, um, and so that's why I'm very happy and I'm very, uh, I'm very grateful for the, those two huge uh, recognition. Very unexpected. Thank you. And um, uh, Shazad Hamid has won quite a few awards and um, he sent us uh, a, um, a note from him. Hi everyone, this is Shazad Hamid Ahmed, Newsdog Grad 2013. Hope you're having a great reunion. Uh, just wanted to update that I won a Gender Equality Award given to me by United Women Singapore for the documentaries I've filmed over the last 10 years, which includes uh, my documentaries that I filmed in Nepal on child rights, uh, girls' education in Pakistan, and most importantly, uh, the Pakistan for where, where I filmed uh, the journey of four inspiring Pakistani American women as a Newsdog student. And I just want to thank Marsha uh, in particular for inspiring me and helping me uh, and realizing uh, the importance of gender equality. Uh, I, I, I was raised in Pakistan, a country that's not famous for uh, the equality of all genders, but I tried to spread that message around through my films uh, not just in Pakistan, but around the globe. So I just want to thank Marsha for uh, for all that she's done for me. And uh, may you have a very, very safe 2020. And I look forward to joining you guys next year. Bye-bye. Okay. So, and uh, um, I wanted to share... Uh, uh, with you information about Nanfu. Uh, uh, Nanfu has been a great, great um, uh, alum, and she just received the MacArthur Genius Grant. 
for creating intimate character studies that examine the impact of authoritarian governance, corruption, and lack of accountability on the lives of individuals. She also received the Vilcek Prize for Creative Promise in Filmmaking for her lucid and unflinching confrontation of systemic oppression and corruption in China. So we're very excited about that. And then one more um, uh, call out to Yamish, who just won the uh, International Women's Media Foundation Grand Eiffel Award and the uh, NABJ Journalist of the Year. So now, uh, Yamish, do you want to say something about your awards? Uh, they are, I feel very, very blessed to have these awards. Um, they're about, they're focused on my work this year and last year um, dealing with the coronavirus and, and the White House. So I'm excited to, to, to be awarded. I'm also in the midst of still doing the work. So it's great to know that my peers um, have recognized my work. And I'm so excited to be here at NYU because I wouldn't be where I am without Marsha and Jason and Joe and so many others. So even though I looked scrambled getting here, I was like, I have to get here because I know how much <laughs> NYU is important. So I am completely ignoring if Joe Biden comes out to talk because I'd rather talk to you all. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And I know you're, you're in a time crunch for, for our guest from Africa, David McKenzie, who um, is a correspondent for CNN, and Mona El Nagar, who is a correspondent, Cairo correspondent in Egypt. It's the end of their day. So Yamish, we're going to actually start with you in case you have to leave us. But before we talk, I just want to show a clip of you and our president. Mr. President, you said several times that the United States has ramped up testing, but the United States is still not testing per capita as many, as many people as other countries like South Korea. Why is that? And when do you think that that number will be on par with other countries? Yeah, well, and it's, Dr. it's very much on par. The, the, look. We have done more tests. What I didn't, I didn't talk about per capita. We have done more tests by far than any country in the world, by far. And you should be saying congratulations instead of asking a really uh, snarky question, because I know exactly what you mean by that. You said repeatedly that you think that some of the equipment that governors are requesting, they don't actually need. You said New York might need, I, that I might not need 30,000. You said it on Sean Hannity's on, Fox News. You said you know, that why you else, might. Why don't you some, people act? Let, let me ask you. You said why some don't state, you act? Why don't you act in a little more positive? It's always trying to my get question you. To you. Get is, you, get you. And you know what? That's why nobody trusts the media anymore. My That's question why to you people, is, how is that going to impact? Excuse me, you didn't hear me. That's why you used to work for The Times, and now you work for somebody else. Look, let me tell you something. Be nice. Don't Mr. be President, threatening. Mr. President, my question don't is. Don't be threatening. My first question is, you said that you don't take responsibility, but you did disband the White House pandemic office, and the officials that were working in that office left this administration abruptly. So what responsibility do you take to that? And the officials that worked in that office said that you that the White House lost valuable time because that office wasn't disbanded. What do you make of that? Well, I just think it's a nasty question, because what we've done is, uh, and Tony had said numerous times that uh, we've saved thousands of lives because of the quick closing. I mean, you say you say we did that. I don't know anything you, about it. You don't know We're about spending, the, no, about the reorganization know. that it's, happened it's at the, the National it's Security It's the administration, Council. perhaps they do that. You know, people yeah, let people go. You used to be with a different newspaper than you are now. You know, things like that happen. But this was a, okay. this was an or Please, this go ahead. Yes. <laughs> wait, I think all our, wait, all our cameras are off. Yeah, okay. <laughs> there you go. Um, Your camera's still off. Uh, so you have me. My can oh right, start my video. Okay, there we go. Um, Yamish, how um, what's it been like to be confrontational with the President of the United States? Doing a very good job at it, by the way. Thank you. Um, it's been a bit surreal and it's been a bit um, challenging because I think the president has wanted to mislead this country a lot about the pandemic and about the virus. Um, he went from downplaying it 
and saying that it was going to disappear to then at one point being more sober and, and somber about it to then kind of saying, well, we can't control this thing. So we're just going to focus on vaccines and therapeutics. So when I watch those exchanges, it's me really, really trying to press for information that I know Americans all over this country sitting around their living rooms want to know, um, especially at the beginning of this when testing was so hard and we saw cities like New York um, engulfed in, in the virus. Um, so I, I think for me, I've really felt proud of my work because I think in the middle of a pandemic, the, the role of the press has to be to hold politicians and leaders like President Trump accountable. Um, and I've done that, I think, at, at, at my very best. I've tried my very best to also remain professional and poised and not let it get personal. Um, because at the end of the day, I think that the people who watch PBS, who watch me on MSNBC, or, or who are watching any organization, any news organization, what they're looking for are answers to their suffering. So many people have lost jobs, have lost loved ones, are mourning the loss of school and of routine and of human connection that I think that as much as I'm, I, I'm focused sometimes on my exchange with the president, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking there are so many Americans that have to deal with so much more than a president yelling at them. They have to deal with someone with burying someone they loved or FaceTiming their mom for the last time. And that has kept me, I think, grounded in, in continuing to press forward. How do you prepare for those events, for those kind of questions? How do you um, uh, think through, do your research so that you know your facts and can be as aggressive as you are? I read a lot. Um, I get ready to, to think through all the different ways that the president could come back and say something um, that might not be true. So having covered the president now for several years, I know in some ways the things that he says um, often, since he often repeats himself, things that are not true. So I've really gotten um, a handle of preparing myself to fact check the president in real time and being ready to do that. There's also a cadence to President Trump. Um, he often sometimes goes long or interrupts your question. So I've really tried to get in the habit of practicing my question, saying it out loud, getting comfortable with the information that I'm about to um, about to ask him about and, and the information I'm about to present. Um, that's kind of, that's basically the way that I prepare. I, there was an exchange that wasn't played, but it was um, a couple months ago where the president at one point said, I haven't left the White House in months. And I could say, actually, on February 15th, you were in North Carolina, and that was two weeks ago. So I think having so much research ready um, is, is, is part a big part of my job. And a big part of my job is researching a lot so that I have my questions in front of me that I've practiced, but then I have probably 10 to 15 pages of information either in my hand or in the back of my head that I'm thinking through as the president is speaking. So do you miss working in long form? And what do you think about um, ideas in the future as the pressure of the Trump presidency subsides? I do miss um, working in long form. I should say, because NewsHour is a little different than other outlets, um, other outlets would call me at PBS NewsHour long form because I my stories are sometimes six to seven minutes long, um, which is very long, obviously, for TV, where my other counterparts get two, maybe two to three minutes to tell a story. So I've been lucky that at NewsHour, I've been allowed to do stories about the pandemic. I've been allowed to go and inter interview immigrants um, about their experience or interview Amazon workers on Zoom. So I've been able to kind of still maintain that 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 storytelling drive, that narrative drive that I have, um, while also doing the kind of day-to-day -day daily White House stand on the lawn to tell you what the president said. Um, but I think overall, I am my favorite place, my favorite thing at, P at PBS is Frontline, right? I love Frontline. I remember learning about Frontline and 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 interviewing um, and talking to a correspondent for Frontline while I was at NYU. I was in awe of of Frontline and, and continue to be. It's the first thing that I really think of when I think of PBS, even though I work at the News Hour. Um, so I'm thinking, hopefully, maybe down the line, I'll be able to do some more work with Frontline. I've, I've been in some of their documentaries as someone that they interviewed for as part of them. But it would be exciting and definitely um, a dream come true if I could at some point do a Frontline documentary. That's great. I hope that happens. One more question. Um, I was listening to uh, President Obama yesterday on 60 Minutes, and he talked about how the media, we have to rethink the media because nobody hears the same thing anymore. And that we really need to think about how to solve that problem so that people will be hearing the same thing. Um, and news 
truth will be truth. Any reaction to that? I think he's right in some ways. I think it's a it's a real it's a real problem when society as a whole can't agree on facts and truth. And that that ha that was there long before President Trump took office. But he, of course, has accelerated that. He's he's really benefited politically from um, setting up his own alternative facts, alternative facts, as he said. Or um, and he, he, we've seen people close to the president, like Rudy Giuliani, say truth isn't truth. Um, so I think we're in this we're in this place where there are two responsibilities. The media has to be responsible with really trying to press forward and be blunt about what's right and what's wrong and what's real and what's not. But I also think there's a little bit of, in, there's a lot of, not a little bit, there's a, a lot of individual responsibility where, where you're on t Twitter or on Facebook. It's really easy to share something by just reading the headline and not checking the website. Um, it's really easy to only go to the, the, the network that you think uh, agrees with your political views and not watch the other networks. So I watch all the networks, including Fox News um, and, and Newsmox and ONA, because these are, because I realize that we're all living in these silos um, where we get our news from and you can realize that on Fox News might be talking about something completely different than MSNBC or CNN. And you realize how people have such different views of what America is and what truth is and what justice is and who's the victim and who deserves to be treated equally because of their news consumption. So I think there does, that definitely needs to be a truth reckoning in this country where we all can at some point get on the same page. But of course that's idealistic, right? Like Joe Biden is coming in saying that he's gonna unite the country and everyone's gonna get together. But there were now thousands of people that were in D.C. streets yesterday who don't believe that he's the president-elect. And President Trump is likely going to leave office, not into conceding, probably physically leaving the building, but saying that he was, that the election was rigged and that he was cheated out of a victory. And there are some 71 million people who believe that. So when I talk to Trump supporters, and I interview them a lot, I realize that they don't believe in facts unless they get it from Fox News or President Trump. Just the other day, I was interviewing a Cuban-American woman who fled communism, and she was telling me the coronavirus is like, the flu and I was like no it's not it's the flu has killed the flu has killed if you combine the five the last five years of the flu it still would not equal the number of people who the coronavirus has killed just this year um but she didn't believe me and I said well you know my numbers are from the CDC they're from the scientists they're from the tr the Trump administration and she just would not believe me and I left that 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 interview really sad in some ways because I thought that here's a woman who is a, a pr probably a very nice lady who wants to believe in America who wants to believe in ideals but who simply cannot get past the fact that she that she does not um she cannot embrace this idea that there really is a pandemic. One last thing, I was just watching CNN and there was a nurse who was um, interviewed and she said that there are a lot of people that she's talked to who are dying of the coronavirus, who are angry and bitter because they cannot actually believe that the virus is real. She says that those people, instead of spending the last few hours with their family members talking through, you know, how much they love them and, and spending that, that precious time, that little time that they have left, they're instead yelling at nurses saying that this is all a conspiracy theory while while they're dying. That tells me where we are as a country. That's a scary place to be. And yet the media, yes, individual responsibility, but frankly, I don't know the way forward when you have people who are dying of a virus who don't believe that the virus that's killing them is actually killing them. Wow. Um, Alpha, uh, Kamara would like your opinion on, is it okay for the media to openly support the views of one party against the other? think so because it's not our it's not our place to to take sides to pick sides obviously there are columnists there are all sorts of opinion hosts um that people like to watch and that are smart and that do their thing but in terms of hard news reporters in terms of white house correspondents i don't think it's our place to to, to lean on one side or the other or, or the other i will say that we should be in the place of truth so right now we have vice president former vice president now president-elect joe biden who who has won the election who has won the election objectively through trusted sources, through Fox News, through all the networks, through the AP. That's to me, people might say, oh, Yamiche is taking the side of Democrats because she's calling him vice president elect Biden. But in fact, that's just the, the side of truth and the side of, of reality. So I think there is this tough position that we're in where if one side is, is telling the truth, frankly, it looks like we're on one side's um, side because we're saying, hey, this is actually what's true. And I think that that is a, a tough position that President Trump has put us in, that sometimes people think I'm being an adversary. People think I'm arguing with the president, that I'm, I'm trying to take him down or be mean to him, when in fact, I'm just asking him questions that I would ask any president if we were in the middle of a pandemic in this way. So thank you, Yamish.
Thank Thanks. you so much for taking the time to be with us. It's so good to see you. I would like to introduce you to David McKenzie. And uh, I have um, a couple of things to share with you. David was in our first newscast class. This was the biggest story that NYU journalism has had to cover. It was the biggest story that any of us have covered and hopefully the biggest story that we will ever cover. And uh, immediately after the attacks, it was obvious that considering NYU is so close to the World Trade Centers, was so close to the World Trade Centers, that we needed to do something about it. And though journalists are meant to dissociate themselves from the story, it was very hard for all of us because we were part of the story. That was a little <laughs> surprise for you. <laughs> um, yeah, as you say, recall, I mean, you had yeah. you'd had one class before we um, went and covered 9/11, I think, maybe two. Yeah, I think we had two, and then 9/11 um, uh, happened, and the university closed. Um, many of us who were in the program uh, immediately started freelancing for international broadcasters and you know, filing our own reports, uh, as well as doing it for NYU. And I just remember um, very briefly, one anecdote is the day before 9-11, uh, I had left one assignment extremely late. And uh, it was for, in fact, Dick Blood, if any, uh, any of you remember him, who was the uh, kind of intro to writing uh, professor and went to Yankee Stadium uh, the night before 9-11 and the uh, to do one of those kind of very standard writing uh, assignments as a young journalist to do a story on the lost and found a typical kind of local New York story well obviously it was rained out on 9-10 and uh, I felt oh go god I'm gonna have a I'm gonna get an F for this assignment and nothing's gonna happen I can't won't have a story and then the next morning of course 9-11 happened and um, found myself with a camera at the firehouses and down by ground zero. And all of us were just working flat out for weeks, both as students and, and professionally. And that was a snippet from a, 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 a reflection we all did as students with you, Marsha, that, um, yeah, I think it was um, quite an introduction into professional journalism for many of us. And so David, most recently you were in China before you moved to South Africa. You want to tell yeah, us so, what it was like covering um, China? Yeah, and uh, you, uh, as Yamish said, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing seeing some of the developments in the US in the last uh, few years. I mean, you talk about people not having a sense of what maybe reality is sometimes because of the media silos they might live in. Uh, and in China, of course, it's the ultimate media silo for many people because they don't have access to the information that we might have. One example would be, you know, anyone under a certain age that you meet on the street uh, may not know what happened in 1989 in Tiananmen uh, because there's just scrubbed from the existence. And uh, it really was an eye opener amongst many things being the China correspondent was just how much uh, you can have your reality shaped by what media you see, uh, what is censored, and um, there's obviously no comparison to the US, but, but there is a sense of this um, people kind of retreating into their silos of information uh, that was done involuntarily in China. And you wore masks all the time because of the pollution, correct? <laughs> yes, I have to say there was some training for COVID-19 in, uh, in China. Uh, I remember me and my young kids, you know, we spent like four days inside our tiny apartment uh, because the air quality, which was, I arrived in China uh, uh, on a late flight from, um, from Kenya, where I was based before this, uh, before that, uh, into the apocalypse, as they called it. Uh, so I think, I mean, the, the, stories in China were fascinating. The operating as a journalist was extremely difficult. Uh, you had to plan stories well in advance um, and often those stories fell apart 
when you actually got to do them and you had to be extremely careful about how you reported the story so you wouldn't get your contacts arrested or worse. Uh, so it was uh, an extremely, I'm very glad I did that three years in China. And then subsequent to that, I've moved uh, back to South Africa where I'm originally from and I've been effectively the Africa correspondent for CNN uh, since then. So Africa's doing pretty well with the um, uh, coronavirus. Um, I decided not to show the Ebola story on your reel because the elephants were so beautiful and I thought <laughs> we needed a little beauty of animal life. <laughs> um, but have you been covering the virus a lot and the way that Africans are managing better than we are? Yeah, we have been covering it a lot. I think uh, the peak of our coverage would have been around June, July, August, uh, both as a function of how the virus was in the continent, which is a, obviously a hugely diverse place with uh, very different reactions to the pandemic. Um, so you can't really sum it up into one country or one region. Uh, because of the travel restrictions, like many of my colleagues who are fo foreign correspondents, uh, it, it's changed the way we do things quite uh, quite a bit. And uh, rather than just hopping on a plane to go cover Nigeria or uh, Tanzania or Kenya's response, we've had to do this. We've had to find ways to use Zoom and to hire freelancers and to kind of find footage, which has been frustrating uh, because so much of the job is physically going there to bear witness. Our David McKenzie, who has done so much reporting on this, is live in Botswana with more. We do want to warn you, some of the images you are about to see are quite graphic. And David, we can see the elephants behind you. That's right, John. What an extraordinary experience and pri privilege to be here in Botswana. Here near Kasani, you see that group of elephants behind me, some babies frolicking in the mud there. This is their daytime drink. Uh, they'll have several every day here by the river. Many herds behind me as far as our eyes can see. And the problem is now this debate is raging and these elephants could be under threat. Hello. Oh. Tuli's mother was killed. Panda was caught in the fence line of a commercial farm. Mulelo separated from the herd by a man-made fire. In Botswana, conservation success is increasingly coming at a cost. I think what's important to stress is, and since this is a discussion around uh, NYU, uh, how, how we or I still bring kind of the ethos of what we learned at NYU into a hard news environment. Uh, because uh, the, with COVID especially, the, the perception was, and I know that uh, Melinda Gates did an interview, in fact, with CNN, where she sort of alluded to there might be bodies on the streets across Africa. The perception was that it would be a disaster on the continent. And that also feeds into, unfortunately, some of the stereotypes people might have about various continent, uh, countries on the continent. And when it sort of proved that that wasn't really the case, I mean, I think it was important to bring some of that, um, of what we learned at NYU to take things not at just face value uh, and to bring that, I want to say documentary way of looking at things, uh, because I do know that, that there is a tendency to simplify things to such a degree with television hard news that um, it becomes almost um, a caricature. And uh, one example was when we were in Cape Town, right at the height of the virus, and we went to see how they were dealing with it. And you could see that the, the experience with battling HIV AIDS on the continent and the, 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 when the virus hit here and the level of expertise of African scientists was painting a very different picture. So I think it, it, it is always important, I feel, to in the position we're in here covering the continent for often an American audience is to not fall in the traps of those stereotypes. And I think NYU with its approach to storytelling and it's kind of a quirky take on things uh, for want of a better phrase, um, rather than kind of the, the first thing you see has been very helpful for my career, I think. That's great. And I, I'd like to share with everyone that your thesis documentary was on AIDS in Cape Town. So uh, this is, um, you've been building your skill and reporting 
uh, pandemics um, for quite quite a while. I'm going to show um, a clip from a documentary Mona did before she left us. Let's see. Saudi Arabia. There are more than 900 female candidates in the kingdom's first nationwide election in which women are able I grew up in Egypt and I've been reporting on the Middle East for the past decade. Over and over, I've seen promises of reform that never led to any real change. It's left me wondering if change is impossible here or if progress is just so slow that it's hard to see. In 2011, the late King Abdullah granted women the right to play a part in Saudi politics. But activists say any changes are minor at best. Women there are still barred from driving and have to have a male guardian's approval to work, travel, and open a bank account. It's not every day I travel halfway around the world to cover a small local election. And in Saudi, any government official with real political power is appointed by the king anyway. So on the surface, there's not much at stake here. We're talking stoplights and potholes, not jobs and human rights. But for me, covering this election is a good excuse to get inside the lives of ordinary women in a country where they're often invisible. And Fadia is one of three very different female candidates I'm following. She's a divorced career woman. Reem is a housewife from a more traditional background. And then there's Lujain, a Western-educated activist who's fresh out of jail. I see it as a great opportunity to give women a chance to stand next to men for once. You can't believe how hard it can be sometimes in this country. For these women, even this token act of democracy matters. Hey, Mona. So you're, you're back in Egypt after being in New York for so long. Nine How years. How is it going? Mona just got back to take on the role of a uh, New York Times Cairo correspondent. And uh, just as she was settling in, she covered the big uh, explosion in Lebanon. Do you want to start there? Sure. I mean, it's been it's been interesting, you know, I mean, I, as you said, I, I, I moved mid mid pandemic, so I haven't been here for very long, but uh, almost as soon as I arrived, uh, the explosion happened in Beirut. So I took off and went there and it was actually one of the first it was the first time that I was reporting in Lebanon. I, I was based in the region before um and have traveled around and uh, but not to lebanon i had not worked there before so um it was quite the landing for me <laughs> like in egypt and off to beirut and sort of you know obviously it's more complicated with the with with the, the pen, you know the coronavirus and just the precautions that we have to take and reporting in a mask um and uh, so, so you know, I, I think it was kind of obviously a very tragic event, but for me, it was a great way to get started, you know, just land right in the middle of a big news event and um, hit the ground running. Um, so, so, so that was good. And I have since uh, come back to Cairo and taken some time to kind of settle in. And uh, I got my first story out, I think a week ago. And uh, uh, you know, it's funny that you showed this part of the documentary, which was a documentary looking at the lives of Saudi women. And my first story, I guess I always gravitate to gender issues, like, or at least like apply the gender lens to many of the stories I, I cover in the region. And so my first story out of here was um, about a woman uh, who was raped and sort of the social uh, and, uh, and, the, and the response of the state uh, to that when she tried to report it and sort of just the, um, it sheds light on the overall conversation around uh, gender and sexual assault here in Egypt. So is it hard to leave long form reporting? I know that um, you did this wonderful documentary and then you supervised as a senior producer, the production of long form pieces. 
and now you're back to um, multimedia uh, for the times. So how does it feel to switch hats again? It feels, you know, I don't feel like I'm switching hats. I feel like I'm wearing all the different hats, which is nice um, at once and just sort of trying to think what's the story and, you know, what's the best way to tell it, which is, um, which is sort of the approach that I like to take anyway. It's funny because when I came to um, New York to NYU, I was on the print side before that. And one of the reasons that, you know, drove me to apply and uh, come, you know, go to NYU actually specifically was sort of like the desire to expand that set of skills and think about story and how to tell it in different ways and different forms. And if not written, what, you know, what would be a, an interesting visual form. And so that's what kind of like drew me to a uh, documentary and what made me really want to like focus on getting these skills down on how to shoot and edit and what it takes to really tell a story in that kind of format. Um, and so sort of coming back to this point, it's, it's nice because it's like, I never really wanted to abandon writing or I never wanted to only, you know, like tell stories exclusively visually, but it is nice to think about all these different tools and sort of non-traditional ways of, of serving the story and serving the audience and serving, you know, the, the, the messenger. So. Do you find um, Egypt much changed? And what is it like to be a journalist there now? Well, the whole region is much changed, really. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I left end of 2011. This was just after the Arab Spring and, uh, you know, just a moment of definitely a very tumultuous moment. And, you know, you know, the streets all over the Arab world had erupted in protests. And, you know, there was a mixture of hope and, uh, and concern, uh, and you know, about what could happen, and 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 basically a question about what would what what would come to be, and like the you know, you come back, you know, I come back, and you know, about ten years later, and you know, there's a lot of you know, there's civil war and and failed states, and uh, and a return of an authoritar authoritarianism that some people say is worse than what preceded the Arab Spring, right? So it's it's definitely interesting in many ways. Um, um, but also with that, you're coming into a different world in terms of like media, the, the landscape and how people like the spaces that people are using to express themselves and, you know, with like, you know, social media and like a, a generation that's like, you know, I talk to young people here, like people who are in their 20s now and they talk about the revolution um, in 2011 when they were maybe 10 years old and um, and and it's funny one woman like what one young woman told me like, you know, I don't the revolution is dead, but it's sort of also a part of my DNA. And it's not about the, you know, what we, what it achieved politically or did not achieve, but it's almost like it shaped me, right? So her sense of like wanting to express herself and her desire to do that regardless. And and so, you know, so she's, she's a feminist, she's an activist, um, you know, she obviously uses social media as her like platform to express herself. And this is where much of the agitation for change is coming from, isn't these like sort of like other spaces, right? Um, so, so back to sort of the question that you were asking, or someone had asked Yamish, and or this question about uh, truth and the inability to sort of shape and the message or control the message or have a unified or like here is kind of what happened a single narrative or like an authoritative narrative um, is is a challenge for sure, um, and we see how that is playing out in the U.S. On the other hand, in a place like Egypt, where the um, state has a very tight grip, tight, you know, has tightened its control over traditional like media, like television and um, um, you know the, the the social media, where it's much harder to you know control, obviously, and and fact check every single thing that people post is the space though where there is more disruption, where there is an alternative voice, where people can express and can kind of say things that they are otherwise barred from saying and expressing. So it's just a, an interesting right, right. way to look at it from here. The um, stories that you're going to, um, that have excited you, that you can let us in on. It sounds like the, the, the youth uh, culture in Egypt is quite fascinating now. Yeah. 
I mean, I'm excited to honestly, like, just kind of like, uh, I, there's a lot to take in, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm Egyptian. And I, I like I said, I, you know, obviously, like grew up here, and I traveled quite a bit around the, the Middle East. So it's nice to be back and to kind of use that, obviously, like sort of, uh, my own experience and, and to use what I what I've done in the past but it's like coming in and I feel like a lot of it is actually new you know and like you said a lot of it has to do with the youth culture and a generation that's like thinking and operating in a very different way um, and 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 a reality that has very much in some ways has not changed but in many ways has, is changing is always changing and sort of like and that's the exciting part about coming back and like um, looking at it with fresh eyes um, um, I'm excited about about a bunch of different things. I don't know that I have a story list yet, <laughs> but but I am exploring, and I and and I'm um I I do sort of like I think one of the most interesting dynamics, like everywhere I turn, and whether it's in Egypt or elsewhere, actually I think this is more of a regional thing. You you see a lot of like um, just you know women at the forefront of change, um, uh, pushing and speaking up, and you know in 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 all across you know the, the the spectrum of different things and and i think that's like an interesting dynamic i think just the gender dynamic is really something that um has always interested me and and it seems to actually be like uh, can generate a bunch of great like ideas and ways of also uh telling stories that uh, are relatable and can help people connect to this part of the world too and like um and and, and learn more about it Um, we have some more questions coming in. I work at CBS as a producer um, and I'm exhausted. <laughs> and so I wanted to ask you guys for your advice or uh, some suggestions for how journalists and you both cover obviously some uh, pretty fast paced stories, how you find the time to let go and kind of give yourself space to recover from some of those stories and from hard news um, to keep from getting burnt out as I feel like I'm getting burnt out <laughs> and uh, have not been effectively coping with this election cycle. Yeah, well, I mean, Olivia, I, I really feel for you. I look at our colleagues in the US and the political beat and just how exhausting it must have been. Uh, just from, from my perspective, I mean, we, we have a, a kind of weird existence um, often as reporters, uh, hard news. Uh, certainly in, in the case of what we do, it's uh, we are lucky in that we have a combination of kind of um, run and gun, as it were, like that elephant story, while it's not particularly high pressure, was done in an extremely high pressure um, uh, time scale, uh, sort of, you know, 36 hours from uh, getting the story to going to Botswana, to figuring out the logistics, to feeding standing on top of an SUV with the, the one cell phone that can kind of feed the story to being on air. Um, so it's a different sort of pressure. But I, I do think people suffer from burnout and certainly we get close here because it goes through waves. And I think what it seems like has happened in the US political sphere, it's just been one wave after the other, after the other, after the other. Um, and I do feel for you on that. The way, I mean, we handle it as a bureau is because similar, I think probably to Mona and other foreign bureaus out there outside of the US, is that we've always got a, a kind of passion project that we have ticking over uh, for an eventual execution, as well as the kind of day-to-day -day grind uh, that we might be sucked into. Uh, and so, for example, we worked for many months on an investigation on uh, North Korea links to a variety of countries in this part of the continent. And um, you never know when that's going to actually happen. But when you get a breathing space on the news cycle, kind of we went and executed the story, um, which has a different level of satisfaction to kind of a breaking news story. So I, I feel for you guys, I don't know how you've managed over the past few years in the US, but for us, it's about finding work other than the kind of uh, uh, daily grind work um, to, to kind of know that you'll eventually get to, because it's a different level of um, satisfaction. Uh, if, if I can add to that, I mean, um... I agree with all of it. I think, you know, one, one, one thing to think about, at least for me, is always like some of that work has to, 
it's it's a state of mind like i feel like sometimes i struggle when it's like non-stop yes but on the on the you know in the with the same measure i sort of like enjoy it as well and like i know what i'm doing and i'm feeling productive and yes you need to kind of step back and 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 know your limits and give yourself time to sort of like take a day to rest or take a few hours or just kind of sleep in one day or something, you know, or, or work out, but you need to like sort of step out of it so, so you can kind of step back in into it. But I also find that, I don't know if it's true for everyone, but I also find that like moments of like calm or like where things are slower or there's sort of a different struggle, which is like, what am I doing? And, and I guess that's part of like why you need to sort of be working on maybe the kind of fast paced stuff and more of the passion projects that you're like more long term like goals or targets that you have that you can kind of pace yourself accordingly. But I think a lot of it has to do with like you and like just give yourself a break, you know, like, you, you, you know, like literally, but also like just uh, mentally and psychologically, like just tell yourself that you're you're doing fine. You know, it's it's I mean, that that feels like kind of part of the hard uh, the challenge is is how we kind of speak to ourselves. And and for both of you, um, since we don't see that many stories coming from South Africa and Egypt, when we can you help us interpret the stories, what we should be thinking about as educated uh, uh not just journalists, but um, absorbing the news, what we should think about to know truth, to be good consumers of stories from Africa. I don't know what you should be thinking about. I think some of that thinking is for us. I think the challenge, at least for me, is always to think about, okay, like, I mean, there's definitely like, uh, you, you know, like sort of what's the story and how do I tell it in a way that makes it, um interesting and 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 like how do i get people to connect you know um to a place where that's far and a story that's different and issues that are more nuanced and you know just a reality that's slightly like you know different from what they're used to for example and like how much explaining do you need to do and like and how do you kind of kind of close that gap right um um and and how do you allow yourself to also like sort of uh, find voices and characters who uh, are multidimensional and, you know, and with different layers and, you know, like, you know, that just don't feed just the stereotypes, but also uh, convey something that is interesting and can deepen people's kind of understanding, I guess, um, and appreciation for the stories that we, that we are seeing here. So I feel like a lot of the work has to do with how we, I guess, do our jobs. Um, and, 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 and trust that a good story will find its audience. Um, although, you know, it's, it's just like, you know, there's just so much out there, right? So, I mean, that's part of the challenge and, and but, you know, I feel yeah, like I mean, it's part of, I mean, I feel like, you know, that's our mission, right? Our mission is to, to bear witness, ultimately. I, I totally agree with you. And I think the, um, you know, the, in a way, the, the era of uh, Donald Trump has become the golden age of the opinion or the analysis piece or the hot take. And I think there's still space out there, um, particularly with non-US reporting for well-told stories that really are bringing um, what's happening with real people, uh, reported stories as opposed to um, uh, opinion stories. And, you know, I think that's, my one piece of advice, Marsha, in terms of answering your question is, is uh, don't just depend on what, say, we are doing at CNN or BBC or New York Times, is that also have a look and see what local reporters are doing in some of the excellent uh, regional sites online, because you get a different take on um, the stories that are happening. And, and I think Mana re raises a really important point is that the, the, the role of a foreign correspondent or a correspondent based overseas for a US publication is, as she says, bridging that gap between what we see and our audience. Um, so I think what I would do as a consumer of uh, content is find those reporters and those outlets that do that in the most um, honest way uh, possible uh, rather than kind of tapping into uh, maybe what would have been the stereotypes 10, 20 years ago about these countries and their people. Well, I want to thank you both so much 
for participating and staying up late in your office. I think, Mona, you're at home by now. I'm and home. <laughs> it's a very neutral background of home. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's been terrific that um, we've had a chance to spend time with you. It's been too long. David, it's been way too long. And Mona, we're just thrilled to see you and see you settling in. Now, um, we were hoping to do a group photograph. How you're doing with letting everybody use their cameras on screen. Has that happened? Uh, Sarah? No, I am going to make everyone a panelist right now. So hold on a minute. <laughs> OK, so everybody stay and turn your cameras on and we're going to to take a group photo. In this time of COVID. Yep. 2020 photo will be uh, very different from, you know, every other photograph that you have of the annual reunion. Yes, 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 yes. Well, hopefully by next year, you know, you everybody will be maybe back in the same room. Oh, a two. Hi. <laughs> um, hi. We, we have um, such a nice uh, international crowd still, David. We're represented by all sorts of countries, um, including yes. Africa, uh, Sierra Leone. Um, Fantastic. Uh, and... and uh, India and China, of course, and Kazakhstan. So, and France and China. Ah, Shu Hao, you made it. Terrific. Oh, Meng Chan, hi. Hi, hi, hi. Henry, hello, hello. Hi, okay, here we go. Are we all here? <laughs> oh, you, know, you made it. You got Great. your camera up. <laughs> Take a Rebecca, nice to see you. Sarah, can you do a screen save? Yes, I'll do that. So everybody, one, two, three, and I'll take a photo. One, two, three. Bye. And again, David and Mona, thank you thank so you, much. Martha.